Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're discussing the important work of Greenwood Rising and educating America and the world on the buried history of the 1921 race massacre against Tulsa's Black community with special guests, Brenda Alford, Greenwood Rising board member who is a descendant of race massacre survivors and Black Wall Street entrepreneurs, Hannibal Johnson, curator of Greenwood Rising, who with surviving families is so responsible for uncovering and knitting together stories presented by Greenwood Rising, and Dr. Raymond Doswell, executive director of Greenwood Rising, who until recently was the vice president of curatorial service of the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. So it's great to have you all here. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise uh, with the rest of us. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Great to be here. Well, I'm going to actually uh, go over to you, Hannibal, since you shaped so much of what uh, Greenwood Rising presents. But before that, I'd I'd love to go to you, Brenda, as a uh, family member of survivors and also as a board member of the organization And I'd like to just sort of talk about this idea of one part of Tulsa attacking another part of Tulsa. And then that history basically being pushed underground for decades and decades and decades and decades. And and I'd just like to get an an understanding from you, from your perspective, um, how do different Tulsans feel you know, split along various dividing lines of of income and race and religion and churches and and so on. How do you see the feelings of Tulsans surrounding this this incident, the feeling of Oklahomans uh, surrounding this this incident? Well, I think that, uh, first of all, thanks for having us. And uh, I think, you know, in, in, as we discuss, you know, Greenwood Rising and, and basically the opportunities that it provides to tell our history regarding the race massacre and, and Tulsa as a whole before, during and after the race massacre, if you will, you know, people that I have spoken to, they are very, very, many are very surprised to hear this story in the first place because it was a story that was hidden for so long. But, you know, the conversations in and of themselves uh, bring about knowledge, they they educate, and bring about some sense of justice and healing to our communities. Um, it just basically gives, uh, provides a, a space where uh, our community and uh, people, you know, from abroad can come and experience this history, know this history, and have those conversations to bring about some sense of inclusivity uh, throughout the world, if you will. Yes, there are those who say, okay, just get over it. It happened 100 years ago. Um, and that's, you know, that's real. But the thing is, the conversations still and of themselves are very are so very important. We can agree to disagree, but the knowledge in and of itself is so very powerful. Are the divisions in terms of how to see that history also there in within the different communities? In other words, in, in Black communities, do you have... The, those disagreements of, of, of people who want to focus on the history and some people who want to get over it in the white communities? Do you have people who uh, want to focus on the history and some people want to get over it? Are these are these kinds of uh, different ideas manifested across these different groups? Well, in my experience, the, you know, people that I speak to in the Black community are so very uh, grateful to have these conversations for our history to be known. Um, you know, many like myself uh, did not know about this aspect of our family's history until we were grown adults. So to know this and to, you know, experience the greatness of our families and our communities is absolutely wonderful. Uh, Of course, as I've said, there are, you know, those who say, you know, we shouldn't be talking about it. Uh, Just let it go. You know, uh, it doesn't matter anymore. Well, it does matter. Uh, The fact that we are here in this day and time having these discussions in and of itself is so very powerful. Honorable, could you could you give us a a sense of of what actually happened and then talk a little bit about how you uh, created the story 
within a environment that could be experienced by people who might walk in like myself, ignorant of that story and then exit enlightened. So Greenwood Rising as a facility, as a museum was envisioned as an experiential journey through the history of a community. And I say that to say that it's not a race massacre museum. It is a museum that tells the story of the Greenwood District, um, the full story, including its glory days as Black Wall Street, recounts the story of the massacre, but also places emphasis on the rebuilding and the resilience post-massacre. So the, the museum really strikes the, the universal theme that I would call that of the indomitable human spirit. And the tragedy in 1921 reminds us that the imperative of our shared humanity, that everyone is entitled to dignity and respect and worth, that too is a universal value. And when we ignore that, we have things like the Red Summer, so-called race riots in 1919 in America, the 1921 Tulsa race massacre, the Holocaust in the 1940s, the internment of people of Japanese ancestry in America during that period. All these things happen when we ignore the imperative of our shared humanity. So Greenwood Rising really is, is dedicated to immersing people in that notion of those values, having them connect the dots of the history of Tulsa with their own particular history from wherever they hail, and having them think critically about how we advance from where we are to where we might be, particularly as regards race relations. Why do you think that the attack actually occurred? What happened in Tulsa in 1921 really is a confluence of factors coming together. The massacre in Tulsa in 1921 is really emblematic of the kind of racial violence and trauma that was occurring all throughout the United States during this period anyway. So there was that national context of racial tumult. There were some particularistic factors in a segregated Tulsa community, those factors included what I call land lust, the desire by some well-heeled white folks for the land on which the black community sat. Um, jealousy, I use the term cognitive dissonance because white supremacy was the order of the day during this period, not just in Tulsa, but, but everywhere in the United States. Um, so if you, if you, possess that white supremacist mindset that white people are inherently superior to black people. And if you then see literally across the Frisco railroad tracks, a black community in which some black folks are actually faring much better than many white folks in the community, they, they're millionaires, they own their businesses, they're doctors, they're lawyers, they're accountants, they're dentists. It causes cognitive dissonance, which is a misalignment between the ideology that you possess and the reality on the ground. And one way to correct for that misalignment is to bring the black community down a few pegs. One way to do that is through violence. Mm -hmm. So that's a factor. The presence or, of or the, to separate or to separate and, and what we what 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 well, they're, they're already separated. They're already separated, physically separated geographically. The, the, the black community in Tulsa Greenwood District is a, is a segregated black community, and it was successful as a business community in large part because it was segregated, because the dollars, black dollars were trapped essentially in this um, insular economy that was black and, and north of the Frisco tracks. Hmm. And so, 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 you know, that dynamic was sort of already there, but, but to abide that dynamic in the city of Tulsa, the Greenwood district, the black community is a part of the city of Tulsa, um, really was inconsistent with the ideology of white supremacy. So that, that cer that's certainly a factor. And the, you know, the way the media portrayed the dynamics in the community was also a critical factor. 
There's a trigger incident that led to the massacre. That trigger incident was sensationalized by local media, and it really fomented additional hate and hostility in the white community. So it's the confluence of all these things coming together that led to the outbreak in Tulsa. But that outbreak in Tulsa was not inconsistent with what was going on in the United States more generally. Now, Raymond, you're, you're, it's interesting, your background um, with the, um, with the uh, Negro Leagues Baseball Museum it's it's actually the history is unfolding in parallel, isn't it? And and you you've got this sort of America wide uh, purview, but focused on the uh, experience of black players. How does this connect to your next gig, which is which is as executive director of the of the Green of Greenwood Rising? How does how does that experience? And, and your expertise that you've accumulated through service to the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, and you've contributed to that museum, how does that relate to this very violent manifestation of American racism? Well, you're, you're correct in that the, the history of the beginnings of the All Black Leagues or African American or Negro Leagues in baseball was parallel in time with um, all the racial violence that uh, Hannibal had alluded to. Uh, it is bubbling up out of uh, that same cultural uh, mix, but mostly in uh, a lot of our other urban centers across the Midwest and in the Northeast, especially um, from a historical standpoint. Um, and the baseball players were not immune to what was going on uh, in the in the society there. I mean, and you think about the major places where there were black baseball teams like Chicago. I mean, during the, the so-called Red Summer, that was one of the more violent situations that happened. A few years before that, near my hometown, East St. Louis, Illinois, uh, there was there was a similar situation. And the baseball players were trying to manage uh, through this as they were as uh, as a result of African-Americans moving to these places as part of the Great Migration uh, or the beginnings of the Great Migration, um, in addition to uh, uh, the hostilities that folks were facing in Tulsa or slightly different than what they were facing in places like Chicago and St. Louis and other places. Um, uh, it had a lot to do, for example, in, in St. Louis, East St. Louis, it was about a battle for jobs and available jobs that were that were uh, presumed to be taken by the, the black migrants that were moving from the South. So the histories and the people are the same. And I can take those stories in those time periods and and look at what was happening in Tulsa and be able to bring that knowledge uh, to to expanding the story and more importantly, connecting the Tulsa story to the rest of the country. Uh, and and as, as uh, Hannibal alluded to, some of the other uh, unfortunate incidents that continue to happen through history, we can extrapolate that beyond Tulsa to worldwide events as well. It's just a pattern of things that were happening, but also um, how the community responded and rebuilt itself and, and the significance of the baseball teams to building economic wealth in these communities is also very important uh, and an important parallel too. So um, a story of tragedy, but also ultimately a story of triumph as well. So I, I imagine myself sometimes, uh, Brenda, as if I was 400 years old. And if I was a different person, if I was your great grandmother or your great grandfather or even beyond that. And I had lived throughout all these different eras of America. How would I see America? And what would I want to share with others? Is that, is that sort of what, what you all are doing in your work, whether it's with uh, the Negro baseball leagues or Greenwood or personal family histories? Are you embodying the generations and sharing what they would share with your children and grandchildren? 
and other and mine as well. Yes, I um, am just so grateful to be here in this state and time, in this in this day and time, if you will, to basically experience the history, um, uh, the historical place and time that we are in at this at time, if you will. Uh, I know that my grandparents, uh, my great grandparents could never imagine this uh, point in time when we would be discussing uh, Tulsa's history, uh, especially, you know, the race massacre, uh, because it was hidden for so long. Um, They could never. And and your family hid it from you, from. Yes, yes. And as I began to do my research after finding about this aspect of our history, things started to make sense. I started to kind of understand why there was so much silence about this. Our families experienced tragedy, okay? Um, there were so many reasons why people didn't talk about it. And as I began to do my research, I realized that conversations I had that I heard as a little girl were actually conversations about the race massacre, but I did not know that. It was grown folk conversation, okay? And I grew up in a community that basically expressed positivity. Uh, encouragement, love to all of us growing up Uh, because they wanted us to be able to keep moving forward as they had, okay? And as I have experienced and as I have researched the the strength, the courage and tenacity of our our family and community members that they endured and that they basically, you know, uh, had uh, is just absolutely amazing. Um, So, you know, as I think about, you know, being in that space, you know, you know what my grandparents would think or say in this day and time, I think that they would be so very pleased that we are carrying, you know, a lot of the um, attitudes and, and the beliefs and, and, you know, that they had. We're carrying that and we're teaching that and carrying on in the way that they would have us to do. One thing that is so very interesting is that we just completed a, a uh, poll. And you previously heard of the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre. Now, it's actually been in the news quite a bit over the last three or four years. And still two thirds of the respondents said no, but there's no shame in that. I found out about about this about um, uh, 13, 14 years ago when I was in Tulsa and I saw um, a plaque basically under a highway overpass. And I walked over because I always look at at these historical markers. And that's when I first learned. And I'm an avid study of American history. I'm an avid student of American history. Hannibal, I didn't, I had never heard one word about this, this uh, event. And I'd heard about other events. So I, for example, I was very familiar with the, uh, the attack in Tulsa on, uh, by the Ku Klux Klan affiliated groups uh, against uh, the Wobblies, the, the international workers of the world. Right, which was a um, it was a multiracial um, sort of left leaning union movement, uh, but I'd never heard about the much larger destruction of uh, of this neighborhood. So let's talk a little bit about the positive side of what you're doing to change that. What kind of programs um, have you shaped beyond just the experience of visiting museums? How do you ensure that Tulsa citizens Tulsa citizens are informed about this. Let's then talk a little bit about some of the legislation that is uh, wending its way through uh, through Tulsa uh, to try and uh, and, and through uh, Oklahoma to try and 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 not have these lessons uh, shared so broadly. Well, you know, one of the one of the highlights uh, of the recent past for Greenwood Rising is a partnership with Tulsa Public Schools, whereby eighth graders from Tulsa Public Schools are taking field trips to Greenwood Rising. A lot of planning went into this, including a curriculum for their their time in Greenwood Rising. So all eighth grade, the idea is that all eighth graders through the TPS system, which has about 40,000 students total, will will cycle through Greenwood Rising, learn this, this history. Greenwood Rising as a facility comes out of the work of the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre Centennial Commission which was created by Senator Kevin Matthews in 2015 to commemorate the centennial of the massacre in 2021. And Tulsa Public Schools, uh, the Oklahoma Department of Education and other partners um, really prioritized making sure 
that this history was included in the curriculum statewide. So that sort of has has been done. Um, enforcement mechanisms are ambiguous at best, I think, but it's written into the educational standards. Are there any are there any attempts to to bar this? I mean, we've seen in Florida, for example, this whole idea of a barring you know, lessons that would make anybody feel uncomfortable in a public school. I mean, frankly, any eighth grader going through this black or white or Asian doesn't matter is going to feel uncomfortable. So, you know, if you, if the standard is you can't make people uncomfortable for learning something that is distressing, you can't learn anything that's distressing. Right. Um, are there, are there movements to try and restrict that kind of partnership? Yeah. I mean, we have, we have similarly, regressive legislation in the form of House Bill 1775, which also references this notion that uh, making students uncomfortable uh, is, is somehow um, beyond, beyond the pale and, and violates, violates these laws. 1775 really addresses um, bringing up topics around racism and sexism uh, that get to systemic issues that could make people feel uncomfortable based on their race. Um, and so certainly that legislation is a problem, but the legislation on its face explicitly carves out teaching about the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre, which is oh, part right. of our educational standards. So there, there's an inherent conflict because you can't teach about the massacre in any depth without making some people uncomfortable for a variety of reasons. If Wait, you're a white, should, should if you're a white person, you might be uncomfortable because white people were in the mob who perpetrated the violence. If you're a black person, you might be uncomfortable because you were the victim of, of this incredible violence and you're traumatized. So my, my argument has been and will continue to be, if you do a good job teaching this history, you will make people uncomfortable. That, that's, that's a given. So Raymond, should I be uncomfortable as a white man about racism against people who are black? Should I be uncomfortable? As long as you're not part of the system that's doing that, then no, you shouldn't be. You, you want to come and you want to learn. Um, you need to be comfortable with learning. And it's interesting that we have to make truth mainstream these days. Um, but if you learn the truth, you will be a little uncomfortable, but it's all a part of growth and being uncomfortable is being is, is part of growing and being a better citizen. And we want our young people to be better citizens so we don't have to go through this Michigas again. Amen. Well, I, I agree. I, and I respectfully disagree, very respectfully disagree. I think we should all be uncomfortable with injustice uh, against, uh, perpetrated against Indeed. Indeed. Right. I mean, if, 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 if it's if it's injustice perpetrated about, uh, against you as a black man or Brenda as a black woman or somebody who is gay or somebody who's Asian, we ought to all be uncomfortable with that, shouldn't we? I mean, and, and it's okay for, for our kids to be uncomfortable with the with the injustice, to work it out and to to understand that the descendants of of slaves and the descendants of slave owners are going to be interacting with each other. You might as well talk about our shared history and deal. That, that, that's the key point. It's our shared history. That's, right. that's the, the, the greatest point. And we, you can't erase it. You just need to uh, learn it, somewhat embrace it, and try to do better. Raymond, when you when you look at your coming tenure, because you're just starting. Um, at, at Greenwood Rising, and you've inherited from community members like Brenda, whose family has gone through this, uh, somebody like uh, Hannibal, who has shaped this, th your board members and funders who have very, very long experiences here. How do you see your responsibility and how do you honor that without necessarily being chained to um, to the sensibility that has been that has grown up over the last 20 years of effort? so that the organization continues to evolve uh, with you as a leader? Well, it is, it is a heavy burden, but it's one that I take with, with the great honor uh, to move the conversation forward. That's at least how I see uh, my role here. But also, uh, I've been charged by leadership to continue to bring as, as many new audiences to the 
understanding of the story as possible. Uh, and that especially means uh, our local community because we've been very successful just in my few days here, and there's literally been days, seeing that we've got folk from all over the country and all over the world who are making a pilgrimage here, who want to learn about and the story and see this historic neighborhood. So that means really uh, making sure that folk who live in the region have reasons to come back. And for me, that's connecting the themes of this story, um, the, 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 generate, the creation of generational wealth and uh, the unfortunate uh, situation of, of racial violence, uh, but connecting the dots uh, to modern story, more modern stories and more modern voices as well. So in the spirit of the pioneers of, of the Greenwood neighborhood, uh, as well as a reminder of, of the perils of what could happen uh, with racial violence, uh, we will do and try to do programming and, informa and provide information that makes things relevant for our, our society today. So uh, we're coming to the end of our time. Hannah, well, I'm going to give you um, a word, and then Brenda, I'm going to uh, ask you for the last word. Um, I, I just want to share, we, we, we just did a, a, a poll on critical race theory, uh, and we, we asked when should those concepts, not necessarily that course, because um, it's a postgraduate course, it's, it's done by, by people who are studying for their masters and, and those kinds, of, kinds of, of courses. But those themes of looking at history through different lenses, through, including through the, race of, uh, the, the lens of race, but also through gender, gender themes, immigration themes, and so on and so forth. We asked, when should that start? 50% said at elementary school and older. 38% uh, said middle school and older. So between that, and um, between those two answers, we got 88%. Uh, now, it's interesting, 13% uh, percent of our respondents said that uh, history should not be taught through the lens, uh, through the lens of, of race uh, at all. Uh, Hannibal, what do you think about, about that idea of teaching American history, but, but not doing that through, the lens, through different lenses, through and I'm assuming that, that the respondents also feel that we should not be teaching history through the lens of, of gender or, you know, any of that stuff. Um, uh, Hannibal, what do you what do you think about that? How do you what lens do we teach history through or is is, is some lens inevitable? So we might as well use multiple lenses. Look, history has always been taught through the lens of race. It's just a, it, through the lens of one race. The, the, the problem becomes when, when we want to teach history using a, a multiplicity of lenses that reflect the diversity that exists in the population. So I'm, I'm a real fan of, of the late Professor Howard Zinn, who talked about creating a people's history of the United States. So we look at history from multiple lenses with everyone contributing. And then we get a multifaceted, much more interesting history. And it's actually much more correct. Um, we, we have to be honest about our history which requires that we use a multiplicity of sources and lenses to create the quilt that is the history of our multifaceted nation. So when people talk about the history of Thanksgiving and, and you have these, these grand um, paintings of, of the Puritans meeting native peoples and the the trays that are that are you know everybody's all dressed up in their finest and so on. Um, that might be one view, but there might have also be other views. There could be the native the native views that are uh, quite different than that. And that's it's we we should share in that. Is that what you're saying? Yes, and and we should cultivate critical thinking among people who are learners in our society, so that they can they can look at the variety of information with which they're presented and their teachers can facilitate the process of critical thinking. How do you evaluate the information that's presented to you? Um, how do you prioritize and categorize the information? And what conclusions might you draw? What, what options might there be for viewing this history? What, a, what an interesting uh, answer. And it just basically, you're not closing anybody, you're not closing a door on anybody, right? right. 
basically opening the door. And then we can argue about it, right? If if if, if the interpretation that you're teaching me is, and then and then another teacher teaches me are, are different, right? Then I get to make make some decisions of my own, right? And and my parents, you know, if I'm a young child, can instruct me as well. So it's not like the the dialogue is ending. It's they're open for us, right? Right. And, and in the end, if I can say quickly, you're not going to, your whole world is not going to be destroyed or blown up because you have a critical uh, debate about the past. So uh, we're, I like to think we're stronger than what people are making our young people and, and each other out to be. That's a, that's, that's a great point, uh, Raymond. Brenda, I want to share um, uh, the, the last poll with you. We asked should the descendants of the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre receive reparations? And we got a very interesting response. Two thirds of people said yes, and one third said, I haven't decided yet. Yes. Nobody has said no. How do you feel about this kind of a topic? I feel that it is a, a topic that is uh, very much, um, you know, needed. We needed to have this discussion. Uh, personally, I feel that uh, reparations are still in order, okay? But I believe that, you know, people need to understand that the tragedy that occurred to our family members and community members, it wasn't just financial. It was physical. It was mental. It would be a situation that would carry on for generations. When we talk about teaching, you know, various aspects of our history in the schools, for instance, I think it's very important for us to know everybody's history. OK, as I stated before, I did not learn about this aspect of my family history until I was a grown woman. OK. And it wasn't something that was, you know, widely discussed in our community at the time. So as far as reparations are concerned, I do believe that is still in order. It was still in order 100, over 100 years ago, and it is still in order today because it's the principle of the matter to me. It was promised to our family and community members, and that promise was never kept. And it's not like our community members, our family told us to, you know, wait around, you know, you're gonna get paid, you're gonna, no, they did not. As I've stated before, they basically, the, the call of the community as I was growing up was get your education, you know, do your best, be your best. And that is what most of us did. We weren't sitting around waiting for anything, but it is the principle of the matter to me. And, 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 and you know, and in, that, and in that realm, I say yes. I'd like to share something with you. So my family was dispossessed in um, in 1937, they were German citizens and they had to flee after my grandfather was arrested by the Gestapo. And their properties were all confiscated. And under a US government encouraged policy, Germany paid reparations. It wasn't enough. It wasn't anywhere near uh, equivalent to what had happened. Um, and my grandmother also didn't wait around. And the amount of money uh, paid was trivial. But it was recognition. That was encouraged by the American government in the aftermath of the Second World War. It wasn't forced, uh, but it was done. That was American government-supported policy. Um, and it is still being done. About $85 billion in reparations have been paid by the German government. And they're still being paid. And it's still being supported by the US government. So I guess if we were going to be consistent, we as a people, would consider the harm that we as a people perpetrated against our neighbors. I think that that is accurate. That consideration should be given. But as I said, you know, it's uh, in, in this day and time, it's great to see that we have uh, activities within our communities uh, to 
rebuild uh, the Greenwood and North, and North Tulsa and other parts of Tulsa areas uh, to the extent that, you know, it is as equitable as, you know, we find in other parts of the city as well. You know, there are various avenues that are in place to move forward in the right direction. And I'm very, very, very happy for that. And your point that nobody is waiting around? <laughs> exactly. Is the point, right? <laughs> You continue yes. to create the country, you continue to create the city that you wish to have. Right. And, you know, the, the biggest, you know, uh, takeaway for me in all of this is that, you know, as this is being taught, as we learn our history, we learn the greatness of our community, of our people, of our families, and hopefully it makes us do better as well. I will always be so, so proud of my family and our community members, strength, courage, and tenacity in the midst of everything that they endured. Because my reality every day of my life is if my grandparents had not survived those terrible days and hours, I wouldn't be sitting here. And the country benefits from the tenacity of your forebearers and yours Brenda Alford, Greenwood Rising board member, Hannibal Johnson, curator of Greenwood Rising, and Dr. Raymond Doswell, executive director, newly minted of Greenwood Rising. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences and your insight with us. Really appreciate it. Uh, and uh, I can't, I can't, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for sharing your experiences with us all.